Hello and welcome to Otten Math. In this edition of Otten Math, we're going to talk about rational zeros. Pretty cool topic. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. All right. So let's talk about the rational zero theorem. And the rational zero theorem states that the possible rational zeros of a function can be t found by taking the factors of the constant term over the factors of the leading coefficient. So what the heck is a constant term? The constant term is that value in the polynomial that never changes. So constant means never changing. And the only value that is not going to change here is 5. As x varies, then 14x will change. As x varies, 2x squared will change. As x changes, 9x cubed will change. So the constant term is here is 5. All right. What the heck is a leading coefficient? Well, the leading coefficient is that coefficient in front of, or the value, in front of the term with the highest number for an exponent. So identify that value here as negative 9. Highest exponent out of this polynomial is going to be 3. The coefficient or term in front of the variable is going to be negative 9. So the leading coefficient is negative 9. So I suggest to my students it's best to rewrite the function starting with a term with the highest number for an exponent, which would be negative 9x cubed, placing subsequent terms with the second highest and then third highest and so on for an exponent. The constant term I place at the end of the function. So I would rewrite this polynomial as 9x cubed minus 2x squared plus 14x plus 5. I have my constant of 5, which is the last value, last term, and negative 9 is a leading coefficient. Negative 9 is a coefficient of the term negative 9x cubed. So I can figure out the possible zeros based on the rational zero theorem. The possible, possible but not actual zeros by taking uh, the factors of the leading coefficient, I'm sorry, the factors of the constant over the factors of the leading coefficient. So let's use that example here. I have five, I've identified five as my constant and negative nine as my leading coefficient. I find the factors of five to be plus or minus one and five. I find the factors of the leading coefficient to be plus or minus 1, 3, and 9. So then I can figure out the possible zeros of the function by taking 1 over 1, so plus or minus 1 over 1, plus or minus 1 over 3, plus or minus 1 over 9, and then plus or minus 5 over 1, plus or minus 5 over 3, and plus or minus 5 over 9. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, times 2, because I have a plus or minus, I have 12 different possibilities uh, which could be zeros for this particular polynomial. Okay, so just remember when I'm using the rational zero theorem to find zeros of the function, that zeros or roots are just values of x which make the function or the y value equal to zero. It's just where the graph crosses the x-axis. So where I've placed a circle here, that's where the graph is crossing the x-axis. So you can see here I have one, two, three, four different roots. So again, zeros or roots are values of x which make the function or y equal to zero. Zeros are the values of x where the graph crosses the x-axis. So they're not factors of a polynomial. They are uh, solutions or they're roots or they're zeros of the function. They're just telling us where the graph crosses the x-axis and where y is equal to zero. Right, so step, the steps we're going to take when we uh, f uh, determine what the zeros or roots are using the rational zero theorem. First thing we're going to do is we're going to list the possible rational zeros. Well, how do we do that? We need to determine the constant term and we need to determine the leading coefficient. So we do that by identifying or reordering the polynomial, again, with a term with the highest uh, degree exponent first, then the next highest degree exponent, and then the next, and then finally the constant. So the constant term is 12, the leading coefficient is 1. Then we find the factors of the constant term and also the leading coefficient. So the factors of 12 are going to be plus or minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. The factors of the leading coefficient are plus or minus 1. So when the leading coefficient is 1 or minus 1, it will not affect, uh, actually what we can do is just state the factors of the constant term as the possible zeros, right? Because anything over one is going to be equal to itself. So this, when the, uh, when the leading coefficient is equal to one or minus one, then the factors, or the possible zeros, are just gonna be the factors of the constant term. 
All right, so now we're going to determine the possible zeros or roots by dividing the factors of the constant term by the factors of the leading coefficient. And as you can see, as I explained, the factors of the constant are going to be the possible zeros, right? Because anything over 1 is still itself. The possible zeros are plus or minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. Okay, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to set up our uh, synthetic division system. And we're going to place the coefficients, as we've done when we use synthetic division, in order 1, 2, 1, 2, negative 11, plus 12. 1, 2, negative 11, and plus 12. And then we're going to, we're going to guess and check each of these individual uh, roots in order to see if the resulting value at the end is going to be 0. If this last value is 0, then I know that the uh, value that I placed in as the divisor or the root is going to be a 0. So I'm not going to go through all of them. Let's just try one. And I'm going to test out negative 2 as a root. As a factor, negative 2 would give me x plus 2. Right? So remember the value of x that makes this particular factor or value equal to 0, minus 2 plus zero, 2 is equal to 0. So the value that I place here as the divisor or um, the value by which I'm identifying the root, that value would convert into a factor of x plus 2. So minus 2 converts to x plus 2, plus 2 would convert to x minus 2. So we're going to test this number to see if it results in a 0. So I bring the 1 down, so it's 1 plus 0 is 1. Negative 2 times 1 is going to be negative 2. 2 plus negative 2 is 0. Negative 2 times 0 is going to be 0. Negative 11 plus 0 is negative 11. Negative 2 plus negative 11 is 22. And my result is going to be 34. So let's just check that again. It's very easy to make mistakes in this process. It's always best to double check. I have negative 2 as my 0. I'm testing this out. I drop the 1 down. 1 times negative 2 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. Negative 2 times 0 is 0. Negative 11 plus 0 is a negative 11. Negative 2 times 11 is 22. 22 plus 12 is 34. So I know then that negative 2 is not going to be a root. So in this case, we're going to have to go through all of these values until we find at least one that gives us uh, a 0 in the last bottom right corner of the synthetic division system. And when we have that, we know that we have a 0 for the function. Now, if we get to the point where we have a 0 and we have three terms left as a quotient, I know that this is going to be the constant here. This is always the last value is always the remainder. Then I have 0x here, and I have x squared here. So I have x squared minus 11. Now, if I get to this point, I can use the quadratic formula or my factoring in order to figure out what the other two zeros are. So let's just pretend that negative 2 gave me a 0 as a result. Then I could find the other two zeros by using diamond and box, factoring the quadratic, or using the quadratic equation. In this case, I say x squared is equal to, or just solving for x in this case, x squared is equal to 11, or x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 11. So if negative 2 was one of my roots, then I also had plus or minus the square root of 11 as my other two roots. And that's how you find the roots, or the solutions, or the zeros of this particular polynomial.